Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My Boomer Buddy Podcast, where we tell it like it was and is. Today's going to be fun. I'm actually flying solo today. The other Boomer Buddies, they had stuff to do, and that's cool. Today, I'm going to talk about something that I think every baby boomer remembers, and I think most people remember what I'm going to talk about fondly. Here it goes. Leave it to Beaver. The show first came along in 1957, and it ran for six seasons. It ended in 1963, and it has been in continuous syndication. It's the longest syndicated show, I believe. The subject matter in a half-hour episode is usually something where there is a lesson learned by the end. Now, the characters are pretty interesting. It was created by Bob Mosier and Joe Connolly. They go way back to New York days working for the Walter Thompson Agency. They formed a partnership and they developed a lot of different shows, including Amos and Andy. And then later on with Leave it to Beaver, a show called The Munsters. Now, their idea for the show was to basically have a show where you don't have a big punchline for a joke. Most of the shows back then, you got the setup and the punchline. Go for the big laugh. Well, in an interview, I heard Tony Dow say that if in rehearsal something got a big laugh, they would take it out of there or, or modify it a little bit. They're basically going for everyday life in a household. Now, it went for six seasons, like I mentioned, 234 episodes. And then later on, they did a uh, Leave it to Beaver movie back in the 80s and also did a reboot, the new Leave it to Beaver. I'm focusing on the original series. Uh, I loved the style back then, the cars, the fashion, just the way people were and the way they treated people. Joe Connolly and Bob Mosier were the creators and the main writers. And uh, later on, as the season went on, they had other writers, but they were hands-on because they wanted it to be true to what was going on. Now, I'm going to answer questions that were sent in to me in a little bit, but I just kind of want to run down the characters right now. In the pilot episode, the only remaining cast members were Jerry Mathers and Barbara Billingsley. Ward Cleaver got replaced. As we know, it was given to Hugh Beaumont. Hugh Beaumont is an interesting character. He was an actor for many years, did a lot of B-movies, played played the heavy, the troubled guy, the tough guy. A lot of his roles were uncredited. He was the right guy for the part, as it turned out. He was an ordained minister. The way that he came across, you know, he could get upset and everything, but he's pretty pretty level-headed. And when you listen to the way they wrote the stories, his dad would not have been so understanding with him when he was a boy. He had the strap taken to him. So different idea of parenting compared to what he grew up with. But Hugh Beaumont really brought believability to that role. Now, Wally Cleaver, the actor who portrayed him, basically went through a growth spurt and outgrew the role. Tony Dow went along to the auditions with a buddy uh, just to hang out. and. They talked him into trying out, and he got the part. Tony Dow was a very athletic young kid. He was a junior Olympics diving champion and very athletic, as you saw. And if you can remember in the episodes, he was the athlete. He could do anything. Beaver was always trying to keep up with him and, and trying to match him, even though they're totally two different kids. Jerry Mathers, of course, was an experienced child actor. He had done many things. He had worked with... Alfred Hitchcock, and Jerry Mathers often talks about how whenever he would see Alfred Hitchcock in the studio lot somewhere, he'd always call him Mr. Mathers, and that's, that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to have one of the best directors ever acknowledge you like that. Barbara Billingsley, she was an experienced actress as well. She maintained the role uh, even after the pilot. And she was perfect for that role as well. We'll get into some of the favorite episodes that were elected from a MeTV survey. MeTV is who carries the show, by the way. I watch it every weekday morning from 7 
a.m. to 8 a.m. Central Time. So I like to get my fix. Let's talk about some of the supporting characters. A lot of these developed as time went on. First of all, let's cover the friends of Beaver. Beaver's first best friend was Larry Mondello. Now, Larry was always seen eating something. He'd pull an apple, half-eaten apple out of his pocket, a candy bar, popcorn, whatever. I watched an episode the other day where he was just chowing down a candy bar at the movie theater, and, and then he reached over and started grabbing popcorn out of Beaver's popcorn box. He was always getting Beaver into trouble, talking Beaver into situations that you're just groaning, watching, going, no, Beaver, no. For example, this morning, Ward had a prized baseball, autographed baseball, that he had gotten as a 17-year-old of some of the greatest players of the day. Babe Ruth, Bill Dickey, uh, Lou Gehrig, and some of the others that uh, of that era. And he was very proud of that ball. And he had fashioned a, a little holder for it and put it in his den, Ward's famous den, and uh, told the boys about it. And, of course, they didn't know half the guys on there, if, if any. And, but it meant a lot to Ward. And he, he said, don't mess around with it. Well, sure enough, the parents had something going on, and they left. And Wally came around the corner when uh, Larry and Beaver were just coming out of the den. They had just looked at the ball. And Wally looked at them like only a big brother can and said, what are you guys up to? And they said, we're not up to anything. Well, even if you aren't, don't do anything you shouldn't do. That's kind of foretelling right there. Well, Larry talked beaver into going into the front yard and just throw throw it a couple of times these great baseball players threw it so let's throw it and beaver's like no no it's not for throwing it's for showing larry talked him into it they went out threw the ball four times counted of course larry goes oh we didn't do anything bad after four throws let's do it again yeah. beaver said no i don't think so oh no come on beef so they threw it four more times well larry is by the house and he goes into a windup. He goes, "Look at me, I'm Don Drysdale." And then he does a big windup, launches one over Beaver's head. No chance to catch it. Rolls into the street, and a big truck, it looked like a garbage truck, rolls over and just smashes the heck out of it. All right. And what does Larry do? Oh, gee, you should have caught that. He puts the blame on Beaver, even though he's the root of the whole problem. They they got a baseball, and they tried to recreate the signatures on there. And, of course, later on, Fred Rutherford comes to the door unannounced on a Saturday. And he wanted some paperwork from Ward to go over. And Ward brought him into the den and said, Hey, while I'm looking for these papers, why don't you check out my baseball over there, my signed baseball with all the greats on it. And then Ward noticed that he didn't have the paperwork in his den, so he ran upstairs. And, of course, Fred being Fred Rutherford, everybody's got a pain in the ass friend like Fred, you know, competitor and a coworker. Well, Fred adjusts the time on Ward's desk clock, and then he look, looks at the ball behind him on the uh, bookcase shelf and notices a baby Ruth and just obvious childish forged names on there. And Ward comes in and says, what, is this some kind of a joke? And and then uh, Ward looks at it and kept his cool, realized this wasn't the time, not in front of Fred, to let him know what had happened. Well, <laughs> of course, after Fred left, Ward just erupted on Beaver. And Beaver, of course, what can he do? He was guilty. So he got grounded. He's up in his room, and Larry comes out, whistles, and yells up, Hey, Beef, up to the window. Beef opens the window and says, Hey, you want to mess around? And Beef goes, No, I can't. I'm, I'm grounded. You didn't squeal on me, did you? Well, of course not. Well, I would have squealed on you, and of course Larry would have. That's the kind of friend he was. Ward opened up the kitchen door and had heard the conversation, sternly sent Larry home. Of course, later on, Ward got to feeling bad, and he was going to go up and let Beaver come down to dinner because 
Wally in June and said, oh, it's a shame that we don't have Beaver down here to hear his cute little stories. And Ward kind of relented. And then Wally said, hey, Dad, hold up. I think maybe you should just wait. You don't want to give in on him. You want him to respect you. So that's pretty insightful for Wally being a 14-year-old in this episode. Anyway, Ward remembered what it was like to be a kid and how tempting that was. And he felt good at the end of the episode. But that's an example of things that happened in real life that Joe Conley and Bob Mosher, the writers and the creators of the show, would keep track of and and put into an episode. And we were talking about Larry Mandelo. That's what got me off uh, down this rabbit hole. But Larry Mandelo was a, a good kid. He's a good kid. He had a mom that was just a nervous wreck. And Larry's dad was always traveling. So Mrs. Mandelo didn't handle situations very well so oftentimes ward would have to jump into the rescue because ward was solid so that's larry mundello and he left after a couple of seasons i think he left in 1960 maybe three seasons and there's rumors as to why one of them was that his family moved to the east coast another that was stated by barbara billingsley was that larry's real life mother was kind of uh, behind the scenes a kind of a stage mother you know, the producers didn't want anything to do with that. So the truth is told by Rusty Stevens, the actor who played Larry, was that he was the only outside of the main characters, um, one that was under contract. And as his role grew, he didn't get to hang out with his friends. You know, he had too much time on the show and he just wanted to be a real kid. So that that's what he said happened. And after he left the show, there was some time, and then they did move back to the East Coast. That's Larry Mundello. A lot of people, he was the favorite friend of Beavers. Well, after Larry left, he had other friends. He always had Whitey there, Whitey Whitney. And he was kind of the small, wisecracking kid. And we'll talk about him in a little bit, because he was in the most favorite episode voted by the MeTV viewers. <laughs> The one that really replaced Larry Mandela was Gilbert, Gilbert Bates. When he first got on the show, his name was Gilbert Gates, but it evolved into Gilbert Bates. And he was like an Eddie Haskell. Uh, he was kind of diabolical. And yeah, he, he got Beaver into more situations like Larry, but they're, they're I don't want to say mean spirited, but Beaver should know better. But I, I really like Gilbert. He was a good character. Stephen Talbot played him, and he went on to become a documentary producer. And he tried to distance himself for years from being on Leave it to Beaver. Let's see who else. Uh, Judy Hensler, creepy Judy. She was the one who would always brown nose to the teacher, whether it was Miss Landers or Miss Canfield, whoever the teacher was and tell on people, and everybody hated her. They called her Creepy Judy. She was on the, the show for a few seasons, but then she started to develop from girl to a woman, and they asked her to kind of tie down her upper area so it wasn't so obvious, but she she opted not to do that is, is how I heard it. So Creepy Judy left the show. Some of Beaver's other friends, not always kids. Remember Gus the Fireman? Yeah, Gus was, <laughs> he was the old guy at the auxiliary station, and they'd go and ask him for advice, and he was just a folksy guy who had a lot of world smarts with all the years he'd seen. That was just a great, great character, played by Bert Mustin, who actually became an actor late in life. He was an insurance man, and uh, he started doing those kind of roles when he was well in his 60s. So Bert Mustin. What other friends? Oh, Richard Rickover. He was another guy that would get Beaver into trouble a little bit. The laundry episode comes to mind, but I don't think he was mean-spirited. He was just he was just a kid. Let's go to Wally. Wally's friends. Clarence Rutherford. Lumpy. He appeared as a bully in one of the episodes. He was a kid that got held back. And he ended up being one of Wally's best friends. He was just a, kind of a klutzy guy, kind of a pudgy guy. And his dad, Fred Rutherford, Ward's friend and work nemesis, uh, always bragged on him, even though he shouldn't have been. <laughs> but Lumpy was a great character. Frank Bank played him. 
he ended up being a successful financial advisor and he actually had Jerry Mathers and Barbara Billingsley amongst his clientele. So Frank Bank, Lumpy Rutherford, probably the most famous character as a friend was Eddie Haskell. We all know an Eddie Haskell, don't we? Eddie, his name was Ken Osmond, and he would try to charm the pants off of adults. He was a conniver, tried to be a wise guy all the time, tormented Beaver. Some of the best episodes came from him because he could turn it on and off as an actor. Ken Osmond was really good. And he ended up, after the show, he became a Los Angeles police officer, and he was shot twice in the line of duty. There was rumors about him being a porn star. Not true. Ken Osmond was great as Eddie Haskell, and we'll we'll talk about some of the episodes here. Let's talk about Miss Landers, shall we? Miss Landers was his teacher probably for the longest time on the show. His first teacher was Miss Canfield. You know, Beaver had a crush on her, and there's an episode about that. And but Miss Landers was probably the mainstay. And uh, there was an episode where she got invited over by the Cleavers and the guys at school got wind of it and they were up in the tree watching, but it's a classic episode. You know, they couldn't believe that the teacher had toes. She wore a sleeveless dress. And so her arms were exposed and Beaver was like, what? And I, <laughs> you don't picture your teacher when you were a kid that age of being a human being. So that was pretty clever writing there. But Miss Landers was on the show. Sue Randall was her name. She did a lot of character parts on uh, Bonanza. And I saw her, I think, maybe on The Rifleman, some of the other shows. But she died fairly young in her 50s. Uh, she had a bad heart. She had a lasting impression in her role as Miss Landers. Tony Dow, I, sh I should mention that uh, he passed away about a year and a half ago, July of 2022. He was a successful... Well, acting parts after that, it was tough. He had some roles. You'd see him on some shows here and there. He ended up doing some carpentry work. He was a successful sculptor. And he also did some science fiction directing and special effects, I believe. And he was very successful at that. And always just a calm, cool guy. I remember him on one of those judge shows, uh, Judge Wapner. And he was on one of the episodes as a witness. When they called him up there, the Judge Wapner kind of playfully said, "Don't I know you?" And and he just said, "No, I'm just I'm just a citizen here doing my duty, uh, being a witness." And I mean, that's him. <laughs> Sums it all up, even uh, in real life. Uh, let's see who else can we talk about? How about Mary Ellen Rogers? She was in a lot of episodes, and later on, uh, when they did the reboot of Leave it to Beaver, Wally ended up marrying Mary Ellen Rogers, and Wally ended up being up, becoming an attorney. And, but she was uh, a main part of the show, part of the fabric. Well, that's a good rundown of, of the main characters. There are others, I'm sure I can bring up. A lot of character actors went through the show. I remember Ryan O'Neill was on there, Barbara Eden, the... Uh, yeah, if you if you look, you'll see a lot of people that ended up being pretty pretty well known. Let's go to some questions here. Some of the listeners had sent me when I mentioned that I was going to be doing this show. Boomer buddy Bill Neuenfeld asks, "What was the overall purpose or theme of the show? Was it pure entertainment or was it setting examples for us to live by?" Well, I think it was both. Connolly and Mosier. They took situations from real life, and even some of the names came from what was written down on the notebook, from what he witnessed through life, uh, he being Joe Connolly. All these situations that were written about, his kids, or their kids, Bob and Joe's kids, went through. Bill, to answer your question, the theme of the show, according to Barbara Billingsley, was it was basically an adult world seen through the eyes of a child or children. That's why they seem so idyllic. Yeah, because when a kid looks at their parents, they have all this wonder and all this stuff they don't know yet. And their parents just, it seems seamlessly, put everything into a happy ending. And that's what the secret was of that show. It comes off as saccharine sweet to a lot of people. A lot of people 
really looked to that show as how they wanted their lives to be. Yeah, it was a fantasy show. But you think about it, Barbara Billingsley was right. It was kids looking at an adult world. And that's how they made sense of it. And, of course, their parents were heroes, and they figured it out. They weren't perfect. The kids saw they weren't perfect, but they always taught them a lesson at the end of the show. That's why it has stood the test of time, in my opinion. So I hope I answered your question, Bill. Another question by somebody else. Uh, why did June Cleaver always seem to wear heels and a necklace? Well, the reason she wore heels, yeah, they were stylish. You know, her clothes were stylish, but that's part of the charm of, the, of all the shows back then. You know, Perry Mason, whatever, the styles were really cool. The cars were cool. So, But as far as the heels, there's a practical reason why. As the boys grew older and older, they wanted her to seem like a parent. So she stayed tall by wearing those heels. Which makes sense. You don't want the kids to outgrow the series too soon. Another thing that was asked was about the uh, necklace, the pearls and whatnot. Well, Barbara Billingsley was really self-conscious about her neck. She had a long neck and she had a big hollow, hollowed out part of her neck. She liked to wear necklaces to kind of cover that up and take the attention away from that very in her neck. So she wasn't trying to be glamorous or anything. Uh, it, it was a practical reason. The shoe, the shoe was practical and the reason she was wearing the necklace was practical. So that was a, a question that I've heard asked before and I've heard it answered a lot of times by Jerry Mathers and Barbara Billingsley herself. Here's another question. I think I've answered it already. Where did they get the material for their scripts? Well, in particular, Joe Conley had six, seven kids. I've seen it published both ways. His oldest kid was 14, I think, when the series started. And, of course, that's the prototype for Wally. And he had another one that was younger. And I think his name was Ricky, who became Beaver. It was just endless. The material was endless. Every day something would happen, he'd write it down. Going to see Aunt Martha. That's another character, June's Aunt Martha. <laughs> June loved Aunt Martha. The boys were taught to respect her. and Yeah, so they got ideas from real-life things, and they incorporated it beautifully. Where was Mayfield High? Where was Mayfield the town? Well, it was never stated exactly where. It's just assumed it's somewhere in the Midwest. I know from times they talked about surfing and things like that. They would indicate the coast. And in the background, you know, in the studio lot, sometimes you'd see some mountains and hills, but... It's firmly believed it was somewhere in the Midwest, and they kept it vague on purpose. Another question, how did Beaver get his nickname? Well, there's a couple of things. Joe Connolly, he liked to write names down that he could maybe use in his work. During the war, he had a friend. His name was Beaver something. That was his nickname, and he always liked that, so he, he wrote it down. In the last episode, the scrapbook, which was the first series finale, those shows didn't do a season ending episode, but they did called the scrapbook where they sat around on the couch in the, the living room and they looked at old pictures. And as they reminisced beautifully, they put clips in from some of the old shows. You get to see how it evolved. That was really cool. But it's revealed in that, that Beaver got his nickname because Wally, when he was younger, couldn't say Theodore. He'd say Tweeter, 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 and it ended up sounding like Beaver. Well, that's that's how they explained it. Now, like it or not, that's how they explained how he got the name Beaver. <laughs> I do want to cover some top 10 episodes. I'm going to do them real quick. I want you to just think about them. The Me TV survey, I'm going to go from 10 to 1. Wally's Practical Joke, that's where Eddie and Wally got even with Lumpy for putting smoke bombs in their, their cars, their jalopies. <laughs> they chained Lumpy's car in the driveway to a tree, and they did a phone call that 
Mary Ellen Rogers or one of the girls who called him to come over and help with homework. Number one, Lumpy, nobody would ever ask him to help with homework. And so he goes out there and he tears off in his car and the car went into the road, <laughs> but the chassis stayed there. Well, of course, evidence was left behind. The chain they used had Ward Cleaver's name on it. So that 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 was a good episode. Of course, it got straightened out. Number nine, Wally's weekend job. He became a server at the soda fountain you know, with ice cream and stuff. And Lumpy and Eddie, of course, didn't like all the girls swooning over Wally. So they set up a plan where they pretended to be Mary Ellen Rogers' dad calling an order in for ice cream, which Wally delivered. But the dad did not order any. When Wally showed up, the dad promptly chased him off the premises. But Wally got even. That was number nine in the top ten. Beaver's report card, again. Eddie and Lumpy, they found Beaver's report card. They were in Ward's Den. Uh, they altered the arithmetic grade. And, of course, that didn't go over well. That's a great episode. Number seven in the top ten, Beaver finds a wallet that was stuffed with money. Did the right thing, of course, and turned it into the police station. And after Beaver checking over and over and over to find out if anybody claimed it. He finally went down there on the last day of eligibility for somebody to claim it, and he was sitting there. He was ready to collect it, and sitting next to him on the bench was, turned out to be the woman who had lost it. And it was, of course, Beaver's disappointed he didn't get the wallet, and she promised to send him a reward. She never did. A ward did. And Beaver was really glad that she did. That was pretty cool, a ward to do. Number six, Eddie's double cross. Eddie boasts about going steady with popular Carolyn Schuster. But Wally hears Carolyn's girlfriends say that she thinks Eddie's a creep and must decide how to break the bad news to his best friend. And that didn't go over well, but it ended up fine. Wally's test, that's uh, number five. That was just on the other day. Eddie and Lumpy planned on cheating on a test, so they put the answers on some paper towels in the bathroom. And when they went to ask for permission to go to the bathroom, they went out there, Eddie did, and the answers were gone. Well, Wally had gotten there before them. He had to go to the bathroom for real. He must have found it and crumpled it up and threw it away. But Eddie and Lumpy didn't like that. They sent an anonymous note that Wally, who got a 96, I think, uh, was a cheater. And of course, the teacher handled it really well. And he knew what happened because he's an experienced teacher. And he knew that trick. Number four is one of my favorite episodes, Beaver and Andy. Andy's a middle-aged guy who stopped by the Cleavers seeking work as a handyman. Beaver was outside just hanging out, singing, Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, Clementine. And Andy had given Beaver a silver dollar with a hole in it and put a chain on it when he was born so he could keep it for all time. But despite June's concerns that Andy's an alcoholic, Ward hired him, and he had a little setback. That was, I think, the first episode in network TV where they addressed in a very sympathetic way that people do have drinking problems. So that was a great episode. Wendell Holmes played Andy, and he also played a teacher on there at some point. Number three, teacher comes to dinner. I talked about that a little bit. Beaver's friends, Larry, Whitey, and Gilbert, climb a tree to secretly spy on their teacher, Miss Landers. Now, Larry had charged money for them to do that. They were eating outside on the patio. And when Ward and June went into the house to get dessert, Miss Landers said, hey, what do you think we should do about those guys up in the tree? Because Beaver and Wally had seen it and they were freaking out. Well, it ended up really well. Miss Landers was cool. She she said, hey, do you think we can invite them for dessert? And it, it was pretty cool the way she handled that. Number two, the bank account a package delivered to the Cleaver house from a high-end sports store seemed to confirm Ward's suspicion that Wally and Beaver skipped school to buy expensive baseball mitts with their piggy bank money, but they promised to deposit it in their school account, and they didn't. So Ward, of course, said, you were okay to do what you wanted with it. I, I told you it's your money but I'm a little disappointed that you would waste it on something. Well, it turned out they bought him a high-end hunting jacket and had it monogrammed, and uh, he kind of swallowed his pride a little bit, and, and uh, it was the nicest thing the boys had ever done for him. So that was number two. That was a great episode. And here we go. The number one episode 
that most people talk about is called In the Soup. Well, Wally was worried that he was having a party and he thought Beaver would disrupt, so they got it so Beaver could stay overnight at Whitey Whitney's. Well, on the way over to Whitey's house, Whitey and Beaver noticed this billboard with an extension on it with this big cup with steam coming out, right? So they were kind of waxing, philosophic on, well, is it real? Is there real, real soup in there? Is that real steam? You know, is that a machine making it? Whitey kind of goaded Beaver into going up and checking on it. So he was climbing up there and, you know, Whitey has the famous line of, yeah, step on the lady's thumb. You know, Whitey, Whitey was just a wise guy. He, he could get Beaver to do anything, just like Larry and, and Gilbert and, and Richard. He went up there and fell in there and <laughs> he found out that it was just a steam machine making that. So <laughs> everybody at the party heard that there was a kid stuck up in the soup. But of course, Beaver didn't want to poke his head out and give away who he was. But the fire department came and got him down. By that time, half the town was there watching, including Ward and June. And they're, they're embarrassed that it was him up there. Of course, Eddie made a big deal about it and with all the friends and with his <laughs> laugh. And Ward and June were just happy he was safe and everything worked out in the end. Leave it to Beaver was quite a show that's left a great, impact on society and as boomers nostalgic people by nature we look back fondly to those times i hope you're not too hard on it with your memories just think of it as it was a time capsule to be watched and cherished that's what i do there's so much more information i'll probably do another show on this leave it to beaver the iconic show it's on me tv if you want to find it you can and if you have any questions, go to my Boomer Buddies 4, the number 4, myboomerbuddies4 at gmail.com. Give me your reaction or your memories of Leave it to Beaver. I will do another episode on this. Hopefully I can get one of my Boomer Buddies on with me, if not a couple of them. And just talk about an idyllic, wonderful show from our past. Check us out on YouTube. Hit subscribe and like, if you will, and, and it'll give you alerts. There's a lot of great episodes of My Boomer Buddies podcast up there. We're getting the hang of this thing. It's kind of fun. Just hope you keep looking. We're also on Spotify and Buzzsprout and other platforms that you can check out. For My Boomer Buddies podcast, I'm Rick Reed. I hope you enjoyed this episode focused on Leave it to Beaver. We'll do others. Until next time, we'll see you around the block.